I'm Roslyn Carita, and today we are at Historic Collinsville. That's right here in Clarksville, actually south side, and this is a place that Joanne and Glenn Weekly have developed to be a real historic, wonderful place for you to bring your family, your kids, great history right here in Southside. Stay with us and you'll get to see historic Collinsville. Have you ever been hungry, worried about where you're going to get your next meal? Loaves and Fishes is an organization feeding the hungry. Primarily through volunteer efforts and donations, we are able to accomplish this mission. Loaves and Fishes provides a midday meal Monday through Saturday year-round. We provide food to agencies helping the needy through our distribution program. If you would like to donate, get involved, or for more information, you can find us on the web at www.loavesandfishestn.org. Please help us with our mission of feeding the hungry. I'm here today with Joanne Weekly. She and her husband, Glenn, have developed this whole complex. Joanne, th this is unbelievable. Uh, and you, here she is looking <laughs> just perfect in the period costume. You have done a lot of history teaching yourself in terms of development. So tell us about this house. Let's just start with this one. Well, this house is the Batson House. It was built by Thomas Hatton Batson in the 1850s for his daughter, Miss Kitty. Now, was he from Clarksville or? No, Thomas Hatton Batson was the son of Thomas Batson who came in the late 1700s from the East Coast when he bought the 12,000 acre plantation called Cabin Row Plantation. He bought it from General Nash's widow and he brought, John McAllister brought Thomas Batson with him as his executor and his overseer and his right-hand man. So uh, as they came and they started their iron furnaces, they raised tobacco, they had all of these workers who worked for them. Uh, Thomas had a son named Thomas Hatton. Thomas Hatton had a daughter named Catherine. They called her Miss Kitty. Miss Kitty was about to get married in the 1850s and he built this side of the house for her. Okay, so 1850s, the dad built a home for his daughter. That's right. I would like for us to, to walk, I, I, we know that this has been added to, but let's start, let's just go back into the 1850s and walk into this. Um, and when you have people here, you let them actually go in the room. Yes. Well, let's do that. Let's just go ahead and go in. Would that have been the front door? Yes, that's the first thing we ask people. Now, which side of this house was built first? And they'll scratch their head and they'll think and they'll say, this side, because it's larger. Okay. And then we'll say, what does every house have that this side doesn't have? And it's a front door, of course. Okay. So it was customary in the Norwegian area and all of Europe for people to build one room with an upstairs. And of course they use logs because the wood was available. And this is the earliest side because you see the dovetail notches right and the front door so let's let's go, go ahead and take a look inside. at that so now we have come into the home and of course it's very dark so show us how uh, back in the 1850s we brought light to the subject well actually we interpret this house even though it was built in the 1850s we interpret it as the 1870s house because kerosene was not prevalent until about the 1860s, late 1860s. Okay. So it's important that we see, that's why, plus a lot of the furnish, furnishings uh, would be of the 1870s period. So tell us a little bit, as, as we scan around this room, uh, you had a nice story about this particular table, and I thought this was, was interesting. This is a really rare table, and what did you tell me the name of this one? This is a cherry. American cherry, shoe foot, these are considered uh -huh, shoe feet, shoe foot. lyre base, tilt top, cross banded table from the late 1700s. And uh, we're fortunate to have this. 
our earliest furnishings are in here, and the chairs, of course, are Windsor chairs, as are the other chairs, right. and they are appropriate for the period. So these would have been made in the 1700s? Late 17, early 1800s, okay. yes. Okay. And so this piece behind us is, you know, it's really... It's 1870. A, okay, that it's clearly is older. Um, so in this room, as we kind of scan around, um, back when this was originally Miss Kitty's home, when, when they moved in, this room the would have been the only room or did it already have the upstairs no, built? No, the upstairs was there because the children slept upstairs. Okay, and, and so they were planted served, for children. Uh-huh. This served double duty. The parents' bed, bed would have been in this corner and most of the furnishings had to do more than one duty and that's why we have this wonderful settle table in here. And let me get on the other side and help you. You had shown that to me, and this is just very clever. I never realized this about these tables before, but um, it was the table and the sofa. And you were telling me that this is the original? Yes. Uh, down through time when people couldn't afford mahogany or rosewood, they searched for ways to make things look better, just as we do now. Yes. So this is the original painting and graining, and uh, ladies nowadays know about painting and graining. They would have used feathers, they would have used, of course they didn't have sponges then, but this is from 1840. It was from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and they brought it with them over the mountains, and you can see where the wood has shrunk over time. And we have storage or a place for the baby. And there were lots of babies. Lots so of babies. So you could have put a baby in here. Uh -huh. You, you tied scored. this up and you would have pillows here. Okay. And then you had another fabulous piece of furniture that is for babies. And I wanted to be sure that we showed, uh, you called it the baby tender. The baby tender. Very. And today we would call it a walker. But this is a piece of furniture that is very rare. All right. Everyone knows... Uh, the song, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Well, a lady named Sarah Hale wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb in 1840, and she lived in Sterling, Massachusetts. And this came out of the house where she lived. It is mortised and tenoned. It's very early, and the child sits here, and the little legs go out here. And we have rollers that are pinned. And of course, Sarah Hale was a real Renaissance woman. She went on to become the editor of Vogue magazine so uh, we're thankful to have this. This is an incredible piece. Um, you know, what strikes me is that in child care, you always need the same things, and you had to entertain that little child, but you didn't want them just crawling around everywhere, and the fact that it had wheels so that they could kind of walk with it, but you could rock them. I love it. That is a great And piece. someone the other day brought a point up I'd never thought about that perhaps they would swing it too. You oh, feel yes. under here. It could be, see, the ridge. I feel there's ridges. Uh -huh. They might have hung it up hung in the door up. and That's right. done that. <laughs> they were very wise. So this room has, um, would have been the main room, as you said, that the husband and wife would have slept down here, children up here, a uh, huge fireplace uh -huh. because this was their only source of heat. That's right. And this room, as you said, now interprets around 1870, which really means that the furnishings are a little later than the home. Well, everything in here is pre-18, well, pre-1850, except for our bookcase. Tell, and us, tell us a little bit about the, you, you told the me something board. about the, the, the hunt board and the floor cloth. I, I well, thought that was the hunt board, <laughs> if you read about the colonial times, floor cloths were a substitute for our carpets today. Uh, ladies learned to make floor cloths, and they still use floor cloths in most of the magnificent mansions, you know, around the country because it's something you could take some of the heavy canvas and you could paint it and shellac it and design it. But uh, this is, this hunt board is a particularly southern piece. Um, the old story was, that the reason they call it a hunt board, it's actually a sideboard, is that the men would come in from the hunt, they were too dirty or heavy to sit in the ladies' fine chair, so the Food would be heavily laden on here, and they would have a buffet and sit out in the dog trotter on the porches and eat. Uh -huh. But that's just a story. 
So all the pieces in here have a story. That's all one of the, the things that's so neat. Story. So we're going to go upstairs now and take a look at where, where the little girls slept in this home. So we're going to head up these stairs. These are the original stairs, of course. Wow. So this is the room where little girls slept. In this particular family, this is yes. set up just for little girls. Yes. Um, and so they're separated. I'm sure this was a pretty cold room. Yes, but this door served as a thermostat from the fireplace downstairs. If it was too cold, they opened the door. Right. If it was too hot, they closed it. Uh, very day. sensible. Yeah. But this is a marvelous table. And the reason it's marvelous is because of its age and the fact that it's still here. This is a pine table. This is one piece of wood. Oh my, that's sure Over 30 is. inches in width. Ah. And the top has been turned, the leaves, and the hinges are stamped Thomas Clark. So I suspect it's around 1800. And so this is pine. It's pine. Okay. And we have a little cradle here. We have a pine cradle. And I'm sure this was handmade. Oh yes. And over here, you said that this particular piece of furniture, you really had a date on it. On the back of it, it says made in Clarksville, Tennessee. And it's East Lake, so it would have been around 1870. Wow. Made in Clarksville, Tennessee. I love it. And then the bed, the bed frame itself, do the we bed. have any idea where that came from? Mm, no, but it's East Lake period. It's around 1870. But this dresser over here, on one of the drawers, it says, it will pay you to call J.F. Couts Undertaking and Curtains. And of course, everyone knows the postage block next to the Riverview Inn in Clarksville has John F. Couts. And so that is from Clarksville. Yes, it's from Clarksville. Incredible. And I think this is very interesting. You know, we, we see um, all these pieces of furniture. We see the difference in the housing, but there's some things that never change. And you can see what children played with then, and we know they still play with. Every little girl likes to have a tea set. That's and right. I see a cup full of, uh, it looks like a turtle shell, full of marbles. and uh, They're clay marbles, by the way. Clay the marbles. The earliest Ooh. type of marble. Most of them are clay marbles. You see, they're from East Tennessee. They're made of clay and then they're fire. Oh my goodness. So. Aren't those something? And that's in All the different shapes. Different All colored hanging. clays. I love it. And then I just happened to see this little slate. I, I'm sure lots of kids learn their alphabet on this. Yes. In <laughs> our schoolhouse, that's all we use would be chalkboards. But this is a teaching tool. We call this the submarine. We ask the children when they come up here to find something that was relevant to the Civil War and a maritime battle. Well, the older children have studied the Merrimack and the Monitor, right. so they'll spot this pretty quick. Ah, oh, and this is quite heavy. Yes, it is. And I see under the bed here, we have the chamber pot. Um, this served for the, the indoor toilet. Mm -hmm. And all around this room, we see all the things little girls did. A little miniature ironing board with a, an iron that you had to heat on the stove. Wow. They could iron their own clothes. <laughs> Yeah, and we have their little bonnet right here. So this is a wonderful room, but it was just used for the little girls in this family. Well, the purpose of the lower grades is to teach them difference, the difference so they can learn the concept of time. Okay. And that's because if they don't learn the concept of time, they can never really understand reading, they can't understand history, mm -hmm. they don't know one war from another or one period from another. Joanne taught. Uh, she loves history. She has many, many school tours that come out here. She and Glenn have developed this whole complex really with the concept of teaching what we have here and, and gearing it toward all levels, but, but you have many, many school tours that come Thousands out here. Thousands of school children. Uh, Thousands. Well, let's take a look and see the rest of the house because this is, this is much nicer and more sophisticated than a lot of homes in this time period.
Have you ever been hungry, worried about where you're going to get your next meal? Loaves and Fishes is an organization feeding the hungry. Primarily through volunteer efforts and donations, we are able to accomplish this mission. Loaves and Fishes provides a midday meal Monday through Saturday year-round. We provide food to agencies helping the needy through our distribution program. If you would like to donate, get involved, or for more information, you can find us on the web at www.loavesandfishestn.org. Please help us with our mission of feeding the hungry. Change how children in your community grow. Our children need us more than ever. Donate or volunteer. BigBrothersBigSisters.org We are now in a room that clearly was what we would call a master bedroom. Would that be right, Joanne? Yes, yes. Okay, so t this, this looks, you know, you don't kind of feel the frontier of it. You feel like people are a little more settled. They have a few more items. Uh, this one really impressed me. Can I pull this down? Yes, please do. All right. This, you know, we think of these being on the side of the bed, but that it was hanging from the ceiling. I would never have thought of this and then you pull it back up to change the lighting. That's right. Ah, so tell That's us your little, dimmer. Your dimmer. <laughs> well, these people were upscale. They were able to afford most anything they wanted, plus they had access to it. Now, you may not realize it, but there were about 57 river boats a week flying up and down the Cumberland in 1870. And there was a landing at the end of Shelton Ferry Road. That's why it's called Shelton Ferry Road. So the big boats would tie up down there and these folks could go down and shop. It was a floating Walmart, a floating Dillard's, mm -hmm. whatever you needed. So uh, we don't know for sure where this bed or either one came from, but it's a cherry empire uh, tall bed, but it has this wonderful bed for the children. You see, this pushes under, during the daytime, we talked about space. Oh, okay. This pushes under the regular bed. Right. It's called a trundle bed. And at night, you pull it out for the children to sleep, the small children, mm -hmm. close to the mother. Isn't that something? I, you know, and I know trundle beds, but I never had realized that these big beds that, that I just never they dawned pushed, on me that could uh -huh, have They that. pushed and up underneath. Sense. And like you said, that everything was about space. Everything was practical. Right. But that was a, an interesting point you made about the, the boats coming because we used to think about everything that came here came on the wagon train. But so we're past that in history. We're past we that. now have these big items, these big beautiful pieces that could come on the boat. That's right. They would come from Cincinnati, New Orleans, wherever. In fact, the piano in our church schoolhouse came by boat from Cincinnati and was unloaded at the foot of the hill by a little girl's father who uh, became a music teacher oh. and later was donated to Collinsville. Ah. Oh. And so some of the other pieces that are in here, um, we have this really beautiful bed, but then I see, you know, a woman's work is never done. And so we have, do we call this a spindle? This is a spinning wheel. Spinning and wheel. Historic Collinsville is the home of the artifacts of the Clarksville Spinners and Hand Weavers. And Chloe Northington was one of our original members. And uh, after her death, her son, Wayne Quinn and Harriet donated all of her spinning and weaving equipment to the Clarksville Spinners and Hand Weavers, and this was hers. This was Chloe Northington. Yes, and this oh. was very early, and uh, she was instrumental in our history. We still have her in our hearts. How wonderful that you have a piece from Chloe Northington. I love that. And this is, uh, this is an art. My mama, I told yes. you, used to spin. Yes. Oh, so all the pieces in here then, are, you, you said this was 18? Before 1870, everything in here is appropriate to the era. Okay. We do not have reproductions. So and these are all original yes, pieces. Yes, not necessarily to this house, but to the era. Right. And this uh, is interesting because I don't know if anyone in Clarksville remembers Miss Catherine Allen. Miss Catherine was just a very uh, wonderful lady. Uh, Mary Lou Persinger is her only daughter, if you know Mary Lou. And, Charlie Bill. Miss Catherine has the history of her family on her father's side 
in this. She donated this, and he was a ship's captain, and he would come back and forth from England, and she was named for his wife. So oh. that's where we're, we're so thankful to have oh, this. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And now we see something really practical. We have a little bathtub here. That's right. Uh, now, what is this? Is this... It looks like it's cast iron. No. No, it's tin. Tin. Uh -huh, so could, it's not really very heavy. No, and even adults could sit in it mm -hmm. and like a sits bath. Right. And the feet would hang out. And, uh, of course, there were larger tubs, but we just happened to have a smaller one. It's not necessarily for a child. But how great. I mean, obviously, you would put this right by the fireplace mm -hmm. as close as you could get it so that you wouldn't just freeze to death while you were wet. That's right. But that's great. I don't think I've ever seen, particularly one, this tin like this. I think I've seen pictures, but this is great. And you see them in Western movies, the larger ones, too. Yes. And this is very unique. Um, Joanne was able to get a top hat and... It's original case. It's original case. I mean, that's incredible. And this this is beaver, right? Uh-huh, yes. And um, back when these were popular, I think they just about wiped out the beaver population, yes, they did. didn't they? they sure um, did. Very beautiful top hat. So, and you also have some wonderful photographs. Now, do these relate to this house? No, that's my husband and I at one of the reenactments. <laughs> It's it. a tin type, and it looks old enough. But, it does uh, indeed. But the uh, but how perfect for Joanne and Glenn to be <laughs> right there. <laughs> well, let's take a look now. We cross the dog trot, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about how they designed. You know why they designed it like that. Oh, one thing I need to point out is we have a book here. It's an interesting book on Napoleon. So what we're doing is we're teaching children about literature, but they are not aware of it because they're <laughs> curious and they'll say, oh, who was Napoleon? Well, that, <laughs> like a jury trial, that opens the door. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You are the consummate teacher. No, I don't know. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. Children are so naive and, you know, they're easily embarrassed. So we'll ask one of them as they go out the door to raise the lid and when they raise the lid, lo ah, and behold, a potty chair. A potty chair. Well, <laughs> it's uh, they'll say, "Well, where was the bathroom?" Well, here's the bathroom. They didn't even have to go to an adjacent room. Ah, and a, a step scale. up from the chamber. Pot. Oh yes, because we have mahogany and we have tapestry. We're upscale. Very much <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> We are out on the front porch now, and we've been in the original part and the added part, and we have a number of things, uh, what's called the dog trot. And uh, Joanne, you were saying that this actually, this dog trot concept came over from Europe? Yes, it did, and it's, uh, you'll find many of the houses in the Northeast where they were first built with the dog trot. Actually, this is, the correct name for this house is Double Pen, okay. P-E-N but the southern colloquialism was just dog trot because obviously the dogs could trot through there. <laughs> but it became a work area and a play area and a social area right. and probably a sleeping area in hot weather. And we have this wonderful huge front porch and um, I have this wheelchair here that looks quite old. Tell us how old this is. Well, we think it's about 1870 and it has the original caning so uh, obviously it hasn't been used too much but we're fortunate to have it i haven't seen any others 1870 so mm -hmm. it goes just along with everything else at the house yes and i wanted to point out about the flag tell us a little bit about this flag well the reason we fly this flag is a teaching tool uh, this is a flag a replica of the flag that flew over washington when tennessee became a state june 1st 1796 and you'll see that it has 15 stars and 15 stripes. Okay. Well, Tennessee was sweet 16, and they did not add a star for Tennessee or a stripe. They later added, had an 18-star flag, but uh, we're thankful to have this replica. So that is an exact replica uh -huh. of what was actually flown. That is very interesting. Yeah, it's... And I love it that you, you fly this here. I mean, it goes along with all the teaching that you do. So well, we now have kind of been through the whole house, except we haven't seen a kitchen. Right. And um, uh, we won't go upstairs to the boys' bedroom, and I'd like to point out that the girls' bedroom, where we just came from, had 
their exit had to come through the parents. So girls were protected as they've always been. And the boys had freedom. They could use the back steps. So let's go to the kitchen. All right. You were saying about the Customs House Museum. Yes, the wonderful Customs House Museum has a log house in the basement. And the log house in the basement was built by Barnabas Powers in 1840. This table came out of that house, as did many of the chairs and many of the artifacts that we have here. Uh, there were corn shuck mattresses, corn shuck mattresses. Wow, in that house. In that house, and later we'll go to the smokehouse that okay. he built. But today, you're looking at the kitchen, and here is a very rare child's high chair, and initially I thought that it, oh. something was wrong because it's much too deep. But then after we placed a child in here, it's so long that the child can't kick, so it's oh. by design. Aha! Uh -huh. So the child really wasn't, their, their little legs would stick out. Uh -huh, and they couldn't do all the things that children usually do. And here we, we <laughs> and have, you had something very clever right here. Uh, this is an early hot plate. Now we see plastic hot plates, but the water was placed here and the food was kept warm. It's pewter. That is incredible. So they heated this. No, they heated the water heated and the poured water, the water poured in, it in. Uh -huh. Food was here and so it kept it warm. Yes. That is amazing. And so the table was, was built actually in Clarksville. By Barnabas Powers. And this whole room, every single thing in this room was part of the, the kitchen, kitchen environment. Everything yes. was cooked in yes. here. Huge fireplace with all kind of what we expect to see over here with the, the cast iron, very heavy kettles, um, and all this, the spices and everything hanging dried. What have we here? We have a horn glass, oh. probably the oldest one you'll ever see. A horn? Made of horn from, from, a steer, from a steer. From a steer. That is incredible. And so you think this is very old? Oh yes. And we have a angel food back then. I'm sure they didn't call them bunt pl cake pla pans, but look at the size of that. That's a large family. I mean, how many eggs would it take, egg whites to make that? That is bank. huge. <laughs> uh, and I see a, a candle mold. Candle and mold. also you have a, another stove that was yes. a little further on in period. This stove uh, was covered with rust and uh, Stanley Limer and my husband uh, were able to get the rust off. It goes in the 1900s house, which we're presently working on across from the church schoolhouse. It uh, was made in 1899 and it has Lily Darling uh, Evansville, Indiana, across the back. Ah, well, we're probably about out of time now, but I wanted, to, I wanted you to tell our audience how they get in touch with you if they want to come out for a tour. All right, they call 931-648-9141. We do close October 15th, unfortunately, for the winter. We reopen May 15th, and we're open Thursday through Sunday, 1 to 5, but other days by appointment for tours. And when people come out here for a tour, there's someone available that will help them and walk with them. And well, if them. they order a guided tour, normally it's a self-guided, Okay. then they can spend as much time, they can bring a picnic lunch, they can wander, rock on the front porch and spend the day, actually. Oh, wonderful. Well, this is history and heritage, and it is your history and heritage. And Joanne and Glenn Weekly really helped bring it to the folks of Clarksville and we appreciate you coming today. <laughs>
Have you ever been hungry, worried about where you're going to get your next meal? Loaves and Fishes is an organization feeding the hungry. Primarily through volunteer efforts and donations, we are able to accomplish this mission. Loaves and Fishes provides a midday meal Monday through Saturday year-round. We provide food to agencies helping the needy through our distribution program. If you would like to donate, get involved, or for more information, you can find us on the web at www.loavesandfishes.com. TN.org. Please help us with our mission of feeding the hungry.